Mm, are we live? I live. Yep, looks like we're live. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. Uh, sorry about this late night session, and it literally has culminated in the last five minutes, uh, a few minutes. So uh, obviously, this event was supposed to, this podcast was supposed to happen in the first week of uh, January, but uh, unfortunately, Abhi, Abhijit and I could not figure out the dates, and Abhijit was a little ill, and then we decided we'll push it to the next week. But uh, in a way, in hindsight, I'm actually happy that it's happening now because a lot of, as they say, water has flown under the bridge. So, you know, it's always a pleasure to have Abhijit. So, Abhijit, once again, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Kushal, as always. All right. So, Abhi, let's start like this. Uh, let's do an entire recap of the, you know, the events that have culminated. So let's go from the start because I, you were just explaining it to me offline that it's not just about one incident per se when it comes to America. So can you give everyone who's going to be watching this right now or maybe in the future a recap as to what is this, you know, you know, kind of the lineup of events that has led up to us till this situation as of now? Okay. So the first thing we need to understand is that there is two streams out here that I want to talk about. The first one is, why did America carry out the strike? What exactly had happened, number one. And number two is, you know, all this uh, analysis of uh, sort of Iranian uh, diplomatic sophistication and technological profundity and all of that, that um, uh, people keep going on and on about. So remind me about that because sometimes I lose my train of thought. But coming back to point one, so this has very little to do with Syria. It has a lot more to do with the Yemen conflict. Because remember, it's in Yemen that Iran is in direct contestation with Saudi Arabia, right? And this has led to a lot of um, uh, friction. You remember there was that video of how the Saudi plane was literally chasing an Iranian plane, prevented it from landing at Sana'a airport uh, in Yemen and uh, sort of forced it to turn back and go True. away. And what's happened here is that just like in syria uh the iranians have proven that they're very very good at sort of asymmetric subconventional i'm just going to call it all subconventional warfare because it's three separate things subconventional warfare asymmetric and terrorism all of which i'm just combining for one just to make it easy because you know in a uh, when you write you can think and measure each word when you speak you know you, you can't really do that so i'm just going to use a catch-all phrase right now uh now what happens in all of this is that uh, fine, I'm sure America and the rest of the world appreciate General what General Soleimani has been doing in Syria, which has been fighting ISIS to the point of defeating them. Now, remember, the Iranians weren't very effective at this till in Syria specifically, till the Russians came in. It was the Russians that turned the tide. It wasn't Iran that turned the tide out there. Sure, Iran did a lot of Iranian boys did a lot of dying on the battlefields of Syria, but the Russians were the ones that turned the tide out there. Now, what's been happening simultaneously is it's fine if you want to glorify General Soleimani as a general out there. But remember, in Iraq and in Yemen, these guys have been playing a very, very destabilizing role. In Iran, in Iraq, they've basically created a bunch of militias that have been going around absolutely scot-free, no order, no nothing. They can virtually change the prime minister in Iraq at will almost. Uh, in Yemen, I mean, look, it's it, it's a shit show. There's no other way of uh, getting around that. But then, you know, these guys have added, they've stirred the pot even more. Now, I'm not making a moral judgment on who is right. The Saudis are right or the Iranians are right because everybody has a uh, right to, you know, pursue their own national interests. Fair actually. enough. Now, basically stemming from Yemen and partially from Iraq, what is the sequence of events that happened? Basically, the Iranians were thinking that their stellar role in fighting ISIS in Syria was enough to give them cover to do whatever they wanted in Iraq and Yemen. And this, in a sense, was what the Iran nuclear deal was about. Because, see, there were two sets of sanctions on Iran. One was the nuclear sanctions. The other was the terrorism-related sanctions. And what Obama basically... The, the bargain for the uh, Iran nuclear deal was a whole that both sets of sanctions would come off in return for the Iranian nuclear, uh, uh, Iran agreeing not to go nuclear. So this was two levels of uh, immunity that had built up. Under Obama, it was the belief that they could 
do terrorism because they had given up their nuclear weapons. And once Trump pulls out of the uh, nuclear deal, it's this belief that because we're doing such a good role in Syria, combating ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda and all those people, we can then do whatever we want in Iraq and Yemen. Now, what happened with all of this? First, because of Yemen, to teach a lesson to the Saudis, uh, they carried out a cruise missile strike on uh, uh, Saudi oil facilities, uh, the refineries, uh, I think, was it last month or the month before last? I forget. I think the month but before, sometime. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So they carried that out, which was really quite, a, I mean, it, it was a spectacular strike and it caused a lot of devastation to uh, uh, Saudi refinery capacity, billions of dollars worth, uh, not to mention lost revenues and so on and so forth. Then there was a constant stream of attacks on American troops by Shia militias in which somebody got killed, an American um, soldier got killed. And the last and most direct attack, now imagine this is all graded attacks. First, you attack a critical world resource. Now, America, remember, doesn't import any oil from Saudi Arabia. It's mostly meant for the rest of the world. It's, imp it's not important to America, but it's important to Pax Americana, which ensures all its allies get oil from wherever they want, right? Uh, so first, you attack that capacity. Then you kill a U.S. soldier in an attack. And finally... It's Shia militias that are basically kind of... Now, that attack might not have been actually directed by Iran, but these are militias known to be supplied and guided by Iran for most part. Go and attack the U.S. embassy compound in Baghdad. Right. That for them was the last straw. So America said, you know what? Um, notwithstanding of the great job that you're doing in uh, Syria, Syria doesn't compensate for your actions in Iraq and Yemen. So you know what? We're going to take out the fountainhead of this little um, sub-conventional organization you have called the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, and they killed General Soleimani. So this has been the build-up. Note, this wasn't uh, action in isolation, in retaliation for one action. It's been one action in retaliation for a whole set of escalations that the Iranian government has been carrying out through sub-conventional operations. Right? This is number one. Number two, let's go to what actually happened. So they killed General Soleimani. Now, you know, 56 people, very high ranking officers within the IRGC have been arrested by the Iranians. And Soleimani's own deputy in Iraq, one of the most important, uh, one of his deputies has gone missing. So we now know that these 56 uh, IRGC commanders are possibly American spies. And definitely the deputy was somebody that probably helped the Americans in planning that strike on Soleimani. So this is the level to which they've compromised uh, that organization. It also tells you, you know, for people who are so blase about saying, we should take out Daoud Ibrahim, we should take out Masood Azhar. This is the kind of intelligence you need. It's not just, you know, surveilling somebody through a drone. It's electronic operations, it's human intelligence, it's compromising the organization from within that leads to these kind of spectacular strikes. Now, what's happened is the moment the strike has been carried out, I don't think this is going to erode Iran's capacity for subconventional warfare because the Iranians are very good at building up redundancies. They are not like India. You know, India may, what happens is from Prithviraj Chauhan's time, the moment Prithviraj Chauhan's time uh, uh, dies, all the, um, uh, then there's nobody left to defend India. You know, the, uh, the Ghurids come and take over the entire uh, Indo-Gangetic plain. Then when Hemu dies, there is nobody to take on Hemu's mantle. So then the Mughals take over the whole thing again. So there's all kinds of, uh, you know, things key. Uh, when, the, uh, when the king dies, everybody else collapses. Uh, Iranians don't work that way. When the king dies, everything else doesn't collapse. They've got a very good redundancy measure. And, you know, one of the things about subconventional warfare is you never centralize power. You always decentralize power uh, because it needs to work like an octopus in that sense. You know, one arm gets chopped off. The others still work. So by its fundamental nature and the way the Iran command system, Iranian command system works, um, their operations are going to go on, although they're going to think very long and hard before they start getting too hubristic like they did, like General Soleimani did. Now, how do they attack back? They shoot something like, depends on the reports, between 12 to 16 ballistic missiles, of which four go horribly off course and land in the middle of nowhere. So depending on the total number fired, that's like a failure rate of between 25 to 33%. Now, here's the amazing thing. 
we have seen all these same people who keep saying, you know, Indian and Pakistani ballistic missiles are so inaccurate. They're completely useless without nuclear warheads and all of that. They're the same ones now seeing extraordinary profundity in an Iranian ballistic missile hit. And ballistic missiles are fundamentally inaccurate. So, you know, the whole um, edifice of these people supporting the Iran nuclear deal was, you know, if you go through my timeline on Twitter, I'd keep challenging them, saying, fine, you say that, you know, uh, Iran's not going to make nuclear weapons, but why does it keep producing ballistic missiles and keep testing them every three, four months, long-range ballistic missiles, when they're so inaccurate that the only use for them is having a nuclear warhead, right? Because if you're going to miss your target by two, three hundred meters, the only warhead that makes sense is a nuclear warhead because it destroys everything within, I mean, depending on the range, about a kilometer to five, ten kilometers. I mean, entirely warhead dependent if it bursts in the air, if it bursts in the ground, whatever. Uh, I've never gotten an answer for that in the last three, four years, every time I've challenged them for it, except for them tweeting back and saying, the interesting question, we shall see. I mean, if it takes you four years to figure that out, I, I'm sorry, I don't have much respect for your, uh, I think it's more an agenda-driven uh, defense of Iran than it is a facts-driven defense of Iran. Now, notice these are the same people then who, despite a 25 to 33 percent failure rate of Iranian missiles in hitting their targets here, are now suddenly saying, oh, look at these hits. They are so precise. They have hit these buildings. They knew there was nobody in these buildings. This is one stream of thought. Another one, which is even more ridiculous, is, oh, look, there were actually people on the two sides of the building, but the Iranians hit it right at the center where they knew there was nobody inside the building. Right? These are the kind of manufactured rubbish you know, that passes off as think tankery in the world. This is the whole reason America keeps getting into wars that it can't extract itself from, because this is the kind of quackery industry that passes off as informed opinion in this world. Uh, and this is a very, very serious issue we need to deal with, because, you know, the kind of quackery that passes off expertise is nothing short of mind-boggling. Now, look at the second layer of this. Uh, not only did all these, um, uh, mi there was no way the Iranians could have known where these missiles were hitting. What if they, it had gone and killed a few hundred people or even 20, 30 US soldiers? What do you think the American response would have been? There was no way the Iranians could have known for a fact that these missiles were going to land exactly where they did or they were going to kill absolutely nobody. Let me give you a simple example of why. The same kind of terminal, assume that these are extremely sophisticated missiles with terminal guidance. That is, after they re-enter the atmosphere, they're guided onto their target specifically. Very, very difficult to do with a ballistic missile, unlike a cruise missile. You know, cruise missile is like a plane. A ballistic missile is like hitting a ball in cricket or throwing a stone. You don't know. You have a fairly good gauge of where it's going to come down, but you can't really control it beyond a point because that's why it's called, it's, it's impulse driven, right? Unlike All a right. plane which can be guided through, through to its target. Now, what happens here is, you look at, this is the same technology that Iran has given Hezbollah, which keeps firing rockets at Israel. And those rockets usually tend to miss their targets by quite a wide target. So how is it that one technology isn't working, but here suddenly and surprisingly, this technology suddenly starts working with such incredible pinpoint accuracy? Impossible. Second assumption is that these people were so extraordinarily well trained, that all goes through the window when you consider the response their air defense had in shooting down that poor Ukrainian airliner. Now, I don't know what it is with Ukraine, because Ukraine, for some reason, seems to have more of its airliners shot down than any other country. And I'm not even including MH17 that was shot down, Malaysian airline 17 that was shot down. If you remember, there was a Siberian Airlines plane that was coming from Tel Aviv that got shot down during a joint Ukrainian-Russian military exercise over the Black Sea. This is the second Ukrainian plane to be shot down within 10, 12 years or something like that. And initially, they went on denying that it was a shootdown. But if you remember, I've been saying right from the beginning, it looks like a shootdown. The glide, the pattern, it all seemed to be a shootdown. Now it turns out they used two missiles for the shootdown. Now tell me, how is it that a country with an unintegrated air defense system 
on a hair trigger alert that doesn't even know that planes are coming out of their own airport this plane flew according to its planned route normal take off from imam khomeini airport and it still gets shot down why because they had warning that planes had taken off from american planes had taken off from their base in bahrain now all of this doesn't add up on one hand Iranian missile technology in Lebanon with Hezbollah is completely useless and yet you're claiming that Iranian missile technology is fantastic pinpoint accuracy unheard of pinpoint accuracy in Iraq but then Pakistani nuclear mis- uh, uh, similar Pakistani missiles are also inaccurate even though they all belong to that same development program between North Korea Iran and um, uh, Pakistan that have had this joint collusion happening for years and indian ballistic missiles are also inaccurate then they say that you know oh the, it's very sophisticated operation and yet what you're seeing is that the air defense operators went that sophisticated nothing's adding up you know it's it's this concocted sophistication and profundity that's being force fed to us and if you look at it it's all basically agenda driven they want to show that the iranians know what they're doing that they're sophisticated diplomats and therefore they deserve the nuclear deal again and therefore they'll go to any lengths to justify whatever iran does um third part to this is unintended consequence are iranians now coming out because you know most of those people shot down were iranians and canadians of iranian extraction and that is what everybody's uh, really really upset about in tehran at the moment and they're going around protesting against their government uh unfortunately we know what's going to happen is that the iranians are going to crack down on these protests and throw these guys in in jail in horrible horrible conditions because they're going to label them traitors and american stooges and all of that they've already killed about 1500 protesters so um i won't put it past the iranian government to crack down and the world will do nothing we we just cynically using these protesters we'll uh, tweet a few things about their courage and all of that but when they get shot and sent to jail there'll be no help coming their way all right now let us unpack this uh, bit by bit i have a few <laughs> follow up questions to what you've mentioned so okay we get the part that uh, there is uh, there are you know conflicting claims on one side you know at a technological level as you just said you know ballistic missiles either they are accurate or they are inaccurate obviously ballistic missiles are also directly correlated now to the political and socio you know geopolitical ideology as such they say and political realities of your country so sometimes when the ballistic missile is hitting your kind of person then it is inaccurate and it's a bad technology and it changes as per the fair you know flavor of the day yeah. but here's my here's my problem in this entire scenario now as as indians obviously you know our focus has to be india centric in this uh, now india has obviously got a lot of relations i mean i remember in i think it was my first podcast with you when i had asked you this question about iran and you you had answered us at that that time too but obviously since that podcast you know nothing has changed india is still very dependent on iran on a lot of resources too especially when it comes to oil and gas and other things and we have a port uh, program there too now there was an interesting tweet that had come out uh, if you remember where i think it was the iranian ambassador in india who had said you know he had requested uh, the indian government i don't know what the hell it was to intervene as such first of all what were your reactions because i don't remember you tweeting or mentioning that or maybe it skipped through my uh, thing so i know what your reaction is going to be but i still want to be clear out of the podcast so first of all could india have played a role and what is this conflict going to cause us as a nation because my concern was that what are the what is the blowback of this going to be on india and china because both have far more closer ties business ties with iran than let's say america america doesn't care right actually you know our business ties with iran aren't all that great it's a single point thing which is oil and you know we've actually reduced our oil imports from iran to almost zero now we don't actually import not zero but it it isn't that significant it can be diversified very very quickly uh so uh it it's not that big thankfully even chabahar port never really took off because you know the point is iran always turns to india when the west ignores it but the moment the west accepts it they have no use for india remember historically 
they don't see us as their equals. We're like second rate, uh, uh, you know, chumchas to them. Uh, we're almost a part of greater Iran because, you know, for almost a thousand years, the official language of North India, the court language was Farsi. The court language for most of the Muslim world, including the Ottoman Empire till about 1500, used to be Farsi before they switched over to Turkic, uh, to, Turk, uh, to, to Turkish, to Oguz Turkish. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 we love to see ourselves as some kind of global peer competitor. Iran sees us as a third rate power. We are not their equals in their mind. Let's remember that. We're just useful to them as, you know, uh, sorry to use this word like a condom, uh, when you really need to do something. Uh, China is a much bigger partner, but they also know, th they have a very, very bitter memory of China from the Iran-Iraq war, which is why they don't really trust the Chinese too much. Because, you know, during the Iran-Iraq war, the Chinese were selling the exact same missiles, the CSS-2 Silkworm, they were selling the same anti-ship missile both to the Iraqis and to the Iranians. All right. It was during the same period that they also sold the uh, 60, 70 odd ballistic missiles that Saudi Arabia has. Uh, uh, you know, they sold it to the Saudis at the same time. And the Iranians are like, dude, you guys are the most duplicitous characters we've ever met. We don't really trust you for anything. We'd much rather rely on Russia. They again only go to the Chinese when they really need money or uh, emergency aid and things like that. So, you know, this whole thing about Iran and India being close or dependent or whatever, it's not really true. It's, it's, it's shorn of any substance on the ground. The third important thing was Chabahar. Now, Chabahar is one of those ports which had utility at one point point of time. And what was that utility? It was India's game to provide an alternate supply route to Afghanistan for the Americans so that they could bypass Pakistan. Today, that logic no longer exists because there is no longer a military case for supplying Afghanistan. Uh, the Iranians anyway will not allow it. It was conceived at a point of time, you know, when um, Bill Clinton was trying to make overtures to the Iranians. You know, there was that boxing, that famous boxing match in Tehran where uh, an American boxer actually held up a portrait of uh, Khomeini or Khamenei, I forget now who, uh, during his match in Tehran. And, you know, there was a lot of talk of normalization till uh, George Bush basically destroyed all that talk. I mean, forget where the mistakes are, but it was conceived at a different period of time. And, you know, because in India, the institutional memory is so short, we've forgotten what the initial reason for it was. And now this uh, secondary supply route to Afghanistan doesn't, the logic doesn't exist anymore. Uh, number one. Number two is this fact that uh, when George Bush took over and the regime was changed in Afghanistan, we thought, fine, the Americans may not be able to take things into Afghanistan, but at least we can act as a supplier who will take things for the Americans into Afghanistan. That also didn't work out. The third problem was that that region we were hoping to target, Afghanistan plus Central Asia, it simply didn't have the economic goods. You know, the uh, sort of economic footprint and the kind of products that facilitated transport by road through to Chabahar and then for onward shipping uh, by boat to other parts of the world. So uh, resupply for the Americans out. Indian resupply, uh, as in, sorry, resupply for the Americans by Americans out. Resupply for the Americans by Indians out. Uh, port for Central Asia to come out, plan out. And, you know, the real arrogance was in thinking that India could do something that the Iranians actually do better. Iranians are better port builders. Iran, I can honestly tell you the roads and ports in Iran are far superior to anything we have in India at the moment. So, you know, for us to nurture this thing that somehow we are going to go to Iran and teach them how to build ports and roads was the absolute height of arrogance in the first place. Uh, not based in reality. So I really don't know what this whole... This whole Iran, India, you know, smoochy, smoochy, kissy, kissy thing, it was never based on fact. It never has been based on fact. 
the last great people to people interaction he had was nadir shah coming in third, what 1736 or something like that and sacking delhi and killing 30000 delhi walas that is not my idea for people to people interaction and i sure as hell don't want one of those uh, things happening again thank you very much so yeah that that kind of uh, so, so this, shashank actually asked a good question on the super chat he said who started this iran india bye bye rubbish <laughs> i don't know I honestly don't know. We've never been bye-bye. We've never actually... And this is historical. You look at uh, the... Uh, starting from the Zoroastrian empires, the Achaemenids had no time for India. The Sassanids had no time for India. The Parthians had no time for India. Uh, the Seleucids had some time for India, but the Mauryan Empire, you know, smashed uh, Seleucus Nicator's uh, uh, phalanxes and sent them back. And since then, they never had any time for India. You've never really had a Persian invasion of India till Nadir Shah proper, right? There was at best the Mughal uh, Abbasid War, which was over yeah. uh, Afghanistan, but that was about it. Uh, not sorry, not Abbasid, the Mughal Safavid War, which was over uh, Afghanistan, uh, which has a sort of connotation with that Tanaji movie that's been released because the Mirza Raje was one of the guys who, uh, you know, negotiated the uh, surrender of uh, Kandahar from the Safavid forces to the Mughals and things like that. But uh, that's, I mean, too much detail. Um, never really been that much of an interaction. All right. So then here's my question. So, you know, we the world. So let us look at the American-Iran conflict in the eyes of what has been the socio-political development across the world. Now, obviously, you know, we we have now gone into... So there was the famous time, right? Francis Fukuyama had called it the end of the world the hypothesis. And Francis Fukuyama had said a lot of things. And we've kind of gone beyond that. And now we are entering into a new world of, you know, nationalism rising and, you know, tribal identities coming, making a comeback in the form of nationalism. In a situation like that, what do you think should be India's response then? Now we know, so we, we dissected the part that India and Iran has not had a relation, but as a geopolitical global player, what do you think India should do in this situation as of now, as things are developing? Keep our noses the hell out of this. Hmm. All right. Because see, there's limits to, the, uh, to how much Iran will escalate. You know how dependent Indians are on our NRIs. I mean, uh, not that dependent, but a lot of the money. Kerala runs on money that comes out of the Gelf, as they call it. Uh, so these Gelf Malayalis, they basically keep sending back money. And it's what, almost $72 billion in uh, uh, repatriated money that we get from the Gelf. So uh, Iran's not that uh, much different. Huh? There's a, a highly skilled... Iranian community in the Gulf that keeps sending back money. That's a critical liquidity provider of foreign exchange in uh, Iran. Uh, you know, when I bought my carpet uh, in, uh, I think I bought it in Isfahan, if I'm not mistaken. What was done is because, you know, you can't use credit cards in Iran. Uh, the guy had to put my credit card through uh, some chap in Dubai who charged the card verified that it had been charged, it had gone through, and then I was given the carpet to bring back. So these, uh, you, I mean, you want to call it Havala, I don't know what the exact term for it is, but these linkages to the Middle East, if they attack Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and places like that, what little hope the Iranian economy has, you know, that will also collapse. There's limits to what the Iranians are going to do. They're not going to harm themselves. I mean, they do, but um, there's limits to how much self-harm they'll inflict to score a political point. Okay, then now I just wanted to discuss a little bit about this uh, guy, Kasim Soleimani or Soleimani. I don't know how do you pronounce his name, whatever. Soleimani, so, huh. so now here's the thing. I was shocked when I looked at American mainstream media channels. I'm, I'm removing Fox News, obviously, in uh, in my state of shock because Fox News was going to, you know, toe a certain line. But to see CNN, CN, uh, you know, NBC, MSNBC, they're trying to make this guy out to be a larger than life figure. And I want to point everyone out to your piece in the print where you actually, you know, get down into 
the details about this gentleman and interestingly he was on the kill list of bush and obama both if he yeah. was on the kill list of both bush and obama what the hell is happening in america right now then why are these protests then look i i i honestly don't know this is my biggest problem with liberals you know if you want to bring down all religion and all regressivism i'm with you my issue is that they want to bring everything down except islam and islamic regressivism is portrayed as this great misunderstood hero of liberals you know they ideally they'd want if you actually created a sharia society for them see isis is a poor misunderstood aspiration creature the whole world should be like isis because uh, like isis run raqqa because you know uh, there's no better freedom for women there is no greater liberation of minorities possible than under abu bakr al baghdadi and the fact is this kind of stupidity has gone into the washington post editorial board and the new york times editorial board because the new york times editorial board's been dense as rocks for a very long time because it's mostly staffed by these new york kitty party aunties right high society schmucks who really know nothing about the world but, but they've got some very good reporters but for them it's all about socializing over diamonds and um, you know stella mccartney shoes and what have you at uh, on 5th avenue or whatever and nothing really beyond that but uh, i mean why are we even surprised this is austere scholar to revered general this is why liberals keep losing elections and they don't get it and you know what i'm quite happy because the more crap like this that they write the more elections they lose and i'm fine with that i don't give a damn that's true i mean the electoral outcome of this i mean you just uh, it's almost as if the, the liberal mindset across the world has now become like a religious cult they have the same mindset everywhere it's not like yeah. they, they they behave like that in america they behave like that in india i mean who would have thought i mean it has nothing to do with our podcast but who would have thought that you know they would go and sit with the tukde tukde gang it's a no brainer if you want democracy you have to make sure india's territorial integrity stays but no i will go with the one person who wants india's territorial integrity harm wow and, and and you know what it doesn't surprise me either because this is the level of bankruptcy that they've descended to you know human systems have evolved over thousands and thousands of years uh, you know i'm the first person to admit that religion is an extremely dangerous um uh, um social construct but our relationship with religion has evolved gradually and organically over thousands of years and we've learned how to cope with it understand it and even manipulate it to a uh, to a certain level of accuracy the problem with political correctness is that it wants to take us back to a dark age where rules the rule of law the rules of evidence they no longer count it's all based on feelings you know in that sense you can't say this because it hurts me is no different from the church in medieval europe saying oh hack him to pieces for blasphemy because i don't like what he's saying but the and they actually want us to believe that this kind of barbarism is the new progressivism and they're just so completely oblivious to the dangers of all of this i, I don't even I, i would actually say that liberals of today that believe in political correctness you know in not uh, uh, so called hate speech and things like that are actually far more dangerous than isis and co because isis is an easily definable enemy these guys are the enemies within that are trying to take us back to a age to a stone age that was before laws before procedure before order before anything and mark my words they will be the end of society as we know it yeah and i agree and my problem is in fact i had written about it that, that you know new age social justice uh, mindset is very much uh, as they say abrahamism without the god new age social there is no such thing as new age social justice it is mob justice yeah it is neanderthal mob justice that is yeah. all it is and that uh, freakazoid we saw at those protests appropriately look like a neanderthal 
यू टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट दैट गाय वो जो साड़ी पहन के बिंदी लगा के जो था वो वाला यार इट्स जस्ट अनएस्थेटिक अपेरेंटली नाउ हैविंग एन एस्थेटिक सेंस इज पॉलिटिकली इनकरेक्ट व्हाट द हेल इट इज व्हाट इट इज आई आई दैट्स ऑल आई कैन से बट यू नो जस्ट टू ऐड ऑन दिस दैट दैट it you know what worries me is i will tell you and a few days ago i had tweeted about it you know we have literally come into a time where we can't function as a society with alternate set of facts we just, we can't yeah. what 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 has happened now is there are literally alternate set of facts even in the iran scene so look i get the iranians you know they will have a point of view i i totally get it i mean it's natural as someone who lives in india and if there is a conflict and india is involved with another country i would naturally understand that you know in an india pakistan conflict we will have a certain point of view and pakistan will have a certain point of view but beyond the point you know there has to be some intellectual honesty right to to call sulemani a, a beacon of peace and righteousness is just horse shit it's nothing else complete horse shit look the correct assessment is yes he did a lot of good for iranian foreign policy but the means with which he used it were extraordinarily violent they were horrendous the man was a terrorist make no mistake about it he aided subsidized and planned terror attacks he also used subconventional and asymmetric warfare separate matter which is kind of um according to me you know i i personally think it's legal and it's okay when you're dealing with a, a bigger power but this man was a terrorist don't forget that all right uh was he great for iranian foreign policy interests yes at what cost because he had absolutely no care for human life including of iranians who he was willing to sacrifice in thousands uh uh to achieve certain foreign policy goals right uh there's the second part of this which is that um you can also make this argument about american presidents why spare say somebody like obama from this the uh uh drone program to uh kill a lot more people than had ever been killed before including by george bush so what does that make obama you know people are calling trump a terrorist for uh, saying this was an illegal action but targeted killings was developed it was uh precisely to deal with uh, instances like this where you would um, you know um a quasi judicial targeting of somebody very specifically with the object of taking him out of the picture and they accepted the quasi judicial guilty process you know uh, there were rules for this uh, and it was i think it was daniel reisner he was a military lawyer in israel who came up with this there are five criteria for it i forget what the full five criteria are but one of them was that it should be imminent attack so it couldn't be preventive you can't say i think this person is going to kill a lot of americans therefore i'm going to take him out you have to have actual intelligence that there is an actual attack being planned at the moment that attack is imminent and therefore taking him out will thwart the attack then you take him out there should also be the uh, thing that he is the criteria that you can't bring him you can't extradite him and bring him to justice therefore taking him out is the only other option because he cannot be brought to normal judicial processes to face justice all of these criteria were met now it's one thing for uninformed observer outside to be saying all of this but for the us congress and for the us senate to be talking like this with all their congressional aides to brief them and all of that is just shocking True. So, one more interesting question has been asked on the super chat by Aditya. I can't Aditya, hear you. What? You can hear me now. Hang on. Abhijit. Oh dear. I am. I can't hear you. I'm actually my my can my camera. Me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. 
let me just leave and rejoin shall i okay no problem sorry about this guys because uh, you guys can hear me in the live chat right just quickly update me can you guys hear me just give me a reply come on guys on the live chat say yes no can you hear me yeah you can hear me now yeah perfect yeah all right cool so somebody on the live chat had asked this question what's your take on tulsi gabbard stand on the recent us iran dispute following soleimani's death so what's your take on tulsi stand she is vehemently anti war look it's another point of view i respect her point of view but she comes from the um she, she is very determinedly ideologically anti war and getting into things like this because she believes it's cyclic right in a sense i agree with her the problem is once america has already gotten entangled you can't just disentangle yourself and walk away because then the uh, uh, vacuum it creates is so great that it sets in motion a whole load of forces that you that give cause you trouble downstream so uh, i i understand that point of view but i don't uh, agree with it completely not 100% i think it's not just tulsi uh, tulsi but it's even uh, rand paul right he even the libertarian uh, side of uh, you know this even they are not in favor of the american attacks right i haven't heard that name in almost 4 years now is he still alive yeah yeah he's a senator even he he had commented when uh, when america had gone down even he was like okay. you know i mean he, his objection is obviously purely libertarian while tulsi's objection is completely a uh, foreign policy driven i think uh, i yeah. think in tulsi's case she believes that war is just a back strategy and in the libertarian argument is that we just don't like war we just don't want a state going and you know meddling with other states Look, uh, i have to say that tulsi is one of my favorite candidates period i think she's the only democrat candidate who's actually sane and which is the exact reason why she isn't going to win any uh, any of the primaries <laughs> uh she already hasn't raised the funds to be on the democratic debates and it tells you a lot that for an a uh, farcical debate which was all about you're supported by billionaires no you're supported by more billionaires i am only supported by 20 billionaires you're supported by 47 billionaires for that kind of a farce if the democrats think they're going to win an election based on this kind of you know um uh, kitty party gossip uh, sessions it tells you a lot and that these kind these are the kind of candidates that are getting funding it tells you a lot uh, but it also tells you where the democratic party has gone wrong that there's no longer room for reasoned debate it's all about virtue signaling and saying on foreign policy what the think tanks want you to say i mean congratulations to the democratic party i don't see you coming back to power in the next election but you know you do what you have to do you do you uh i get that okay now apparently some people on the live chat are saying they just had some i think rocket strikes on america just like four american soldiers on some iraqi base right now but i'm not uh, sure of that yeah four rockets on an iraqi base yeah yeah on an iraqi base or something of that sort has happened okay now uh, let us uh, following it i don't have details so i can't talk about it right now because i don't know yeah. what exactly so that's why i was not uh, i was not discussing it but just i wanted to put it on record that you know we are aware of it but okay now let us conclude things so what do you think is the road ahead and give me both the sides okay three sides so obviously the indian side i think more or less you have said india should just say sanuki and just sit in the corner and do nothing pretty much but then if you were looking at it from both sides the irani side and the american side so let us uh, conclude things now so tell me what would the uh, the more the what would be the best thing for the iranians to do uh, as of now from their point of view and what would be the future role or the course taken by the americans as far as your your understanding is concerned look i honestly didn't think the iranians were even going to respond with ballistic missiles that because personally i didn't think they had retaliation options and i think they got very 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 lucky that those ballistic missiles didn't kill any americans all right 
So I don't think I can predict their course of action anymore because I think at some level, some level of policy madness has set in in there. Uh, they're normally fairly good with policy. Uh, this time I'm not seeing it because they've made a whole string of mistakes. With the Americans, I think they're just going to sit and watch because they've achieved their initial aim, which is to say, you know, to tell the Iranians, you know, thus far and no further. If you go any further, we're going to target your leadership and take you out. I think Trump has just tweeted about, you better not be killing those protesters because we're watching you. Uh, will he actually go ahead and do something? I doubt that very much. Uh, you know, I, 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 I really fear that they're the, and you know, this is the really rotten side of American foreign policy, that they're quite happy to have protesters die in thousands to score foreign policy points, which I think is a very sick, cynical thing. But every American president has done it prior. Obama has done it. Bill Clinton's done it. George Bush has done it, both dad and son. So, um, and, you know, they, they'll use it to score brownie points and say, ah, brutal regime. Um, I would actually say American presidents actually want these people to die on the streets so that they have some kind of um, uh, brownie points to score. Uh, it's sick, but it is what it is. But beyond that, I don't see anything much happening. Okay, I have to ask this question. Abhijit, please comment on Iran and Pakistan relations. Do they have any? They do. Um, I, it, it's been much strained because of, you know, this string of... Because, you know, Pakistan, when you have a zoo, a terror zoo, you can never control terrorists. They're always going to attack who they want to attack. And because there's this whole Sunni majoritarianism happening and a lot of Shia... Uh, Shias keep getting targeted by bomb blasts, their mosques get, keep getting targeted and things like that. Uh, Iran's had terrible relations with Pakistan for a while now. You know, Soleimani is actually on record threatening and warning the Pakistanis on several occasions that they're not just going to sit by and twiddle their thumbs. You remember when those uh, 20 or was it 50 odd truck drivers uh, when the Taliban was in power in Afghanistan, got executed. They got taken out of their trucks and shot one by one by the Taliban. Uh, Iran and Pakistan almost came to war at that point of time. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's not a very good relationship at the moment. But thankfully, you know, uh, we have the luxury of not having a border with Iran and we don't have to care. Uh, the Pakistanis, unfortunately, do have a border with Iran, which they're destabilizing like every other border that they have which they try to destabilize best of luck to them i you know i'm happy that pakistan has iran and iran has pakistan i think the two of them deserve each other good luck to you guys yeah i just saw a tweet by imran khan saying hum hamare foreign policy hamare foreign uh, uh, secretary ko bhejenge wahan pe iran mein pata nahi kya karne wala pakistan ko to koi seriously leta nahi but theek hai i think he had to tweet something so he must have tweeted so see, the Iranians, they take Pakistan even less seriously than they take Indians. Um, <laughs> so no matter how much in the doghouse we are, we're still in less of a doghouse than Pakistan is as far as the Iranians are concerned. Yeah, you know, Pakistan is like uh, the, you know, <laughs> Pakistan is that like, like that uh, most uncool kid in the class where the Indians can always say, Inse to hum hai. <laughs> huh, Exactly. Always. <laughs> So, so I guess, uh, I think we have pretty much covered all the aspects of, of the conflict as far as uh, the things uh, are there right now. So guys, uh, as usual, you know, I'm on Patreon. If you want to go and support me there, you see the link on the screen right now. You can go to patreon.com slash charvak. Uh, and, you know, uh, and if there are more developments, I don't know what's going to happen. Honestly, with foreign policy, it's like, you know, playing 3D chess. You never know what's going to happen, what the Americans are going to do, what the Iranis. I mean, you pretty much can guess what the Iranis are going to do, but you never know with Trump. Trump, you know, kind of builds himself on unpredictability or he claims to be unpredictable. I mean, that's what his persona is. So let's see what happens. And if things develop in a certain way, I'll request Abhijit to come back again. So Abhi, uh, I'm... And I'm really thankful to you. Kafi late is time for to aya baat karne ke liye. So thanks a lot, man, for Always coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, guys. Until then, I'll uh, see you next time. Namaste. Goodbye. Good night. Take care. Jai Shri Ram.